Hello, my name is Larry Arn. We're here in the Richardson Heritage Room of the Mossy Library of Hillsdale College. This is a series of discussions of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. This is the second of uh, several lectures, and this one concerns mainly the main arrangements that are in the Constitution of the United States, beginning with what is the most fundamental of them all, representative government. Please watch. Now we have one more hard question to answer, and we'll see why you have to have these things because of these things. It doesn't seem to me very hard to see why these things would mean King George III and everybody like him doesn't get to tell us what to do. He's just a man like us. That's what the claim is, right? But here's a harder thing. If it's true that we can only be governed by our consent, that we have an equal right to consent to the government on us, or over us, then the question arises, why shouldn't you just have majority rule? Now, you could see why you wouldn't have unanimous rule. You wouldn't have that because uh, it's just very difficult to get everybody to agree. Hardly anybody ever thought you could do that. Maybe John C. Calhoun is about the only one who ever thought that. But if you can't get everybody to agree, then the only alternative would be that the majority would rule. Because that, if every soul is equal to every other soul, then the majority would be the greatest number. The greatest number of equal souls makes the greatest quantity. Why can't the majority do whatever it wants? Instead, what we have is this mess right here. And this mess is complicated because we have two houses in the legislature, a Senate and a House of Representatives. And the senators are elected for six years for staggered terms. That means every two years, a third of them is elected. That means they don't change very fast. And originally, they were elected by state legislatures, which were themselves elected by some other process. And the House of Representatives is elected for two-year terms. And the president is elected for a four-year term through an electoral college. The judges serve during good behavior, that is, for their lifetime, as long as they don't get impeached. It's hard to impeach them. Why all these complicated? Why two levels of government? Why do you have that? And the, the point is, shouldn't they be able to do whatever they want if they're the majority of equal souls? Why should a minority be able to stop the majority from doing whatever it wants? Why should that happen? You know, there's a lot of complaints about that especially in the great wave of politics called progressivism that's overtaken the country to a considerable extent. Why don't the people just get to do whatever they want to do? And you have to answer that. The answer to that is, is found up here, too, and in the same way. Come to find out that George Washington you know, I believe George Washington was a better man than King George III. I believe there's hardly anybody ever as great a man as George Washington. I believe that George Washington, if he were given the presidency for life, would have discharged it faithfully. He wouldn't take it. Why not? That's a form of the same question, you see. Why shouldn't whoever is the most excellent rule? Or why shouldn't the majority be able to do whatever it wants to do. These are questions that come up in the course of the American Revolution and the making of the Constitution. And there's beautiful writing in answer to these questions. And the first thing you should know is the American Revolution is calculated so that government by consent is a powerful constitutional feature, the first guarantee of limited government and of freedom. And here's how that works. They say that, well, I'll quote Madison to you. As there is a degree of depravity in mankind, which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust. In other words, don't turn your back on strangers. 
So there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and, and confidence. Republican government presupposes the existence of these esteem and confidence features in a higher degree than any other form. Our form of government is made to depend upon the people. But then, not just simply on the people. Not just on the people every day and at any moment. What's that about? James Madison writes very beautifully about that, and it's worth considering what he writes. What he really says is, we're human too. And think about that. What does that mean that we're human? What are we like? Because we have this uh, incredible faculty, right, that everything we see, we're sorting it into its parts and kinds, and everything for us is in a hierarchy. We know that, that if there's a bunch of people who might be harmed, save the baby first. We know if there's a bunch of creatures that might be harmed, even though you'd regret the loss of a dog or a cat, save the people first, right? We, we see those things automatically, and that's a divine gift. But we don't have that completely or fully. Uh, one can imagine God being able to see everything all at once. In fact, when some of the greatest writers in history have described the properties of the mind of God, what it would be like to have perfect understanding of the universe. You'd know everything all the time, all at once. We don't do that. We have to reason from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And also, our ability to reason is connected to our bodies. And our bodies get tired. And by the way, when we get tired, we don't think as well as when we're not tired. And also, our bodies have needs, a lot of them. If we don't eat, we'll die. If we don't drink, we'll die. We like comfort and ease and security because danger is hurtful and pain hurts. And we don't want those things. And so we work hard to try to secure a life for ourselves and our loved ones. And think about that problem of loved ones. You know, my wife and I really kind of have 1,400 kids at a time in our job because we have all the college students, right? And we know a lot of them and we care for them a lot. And that means that these students are more important to us than students at other colleges. And, you know, our students are better than the students at other colleges. That's why I love them. No, it's not, it's not just that. It's also that they're ours, right? We love our own things first. We love our own bodies first. We love our own loved ones first. And we should do that. We have to do that because that gives us a fuel to take care of ourselves. But at the same time, it's true that we can't really be trusted fully with power over other people. That's the problem. And the question is, how are you going to cope with that problem? If it's a problem in the individual soul, it's a problem in the body politic, too. And one of the great themes, you can find it in the Founding Fathers, but you can find it very powerfully, for example, in Plato's Republic, is that you know, in the action of Plato's Republic, for example, they tell Socrates, these young people that are in dialogue with him, show us that justice is good for its own sake. And he says, well, it'd be easier to show that if we can draw a picture of the city, because the city is big. The city is the soul written up large. They're writings of our founders who think that too. And that means that whatever vices there are in our souls, they might also be in the city. And sure enough, right before the Constitutional Convention, James Madison publishes a paper called The Vices of the Political System. And he says that what's going on is that our passions are running away with us, and we're taking things from each other. And there's disorder, and there's violence even, and there's expropriation of property, and the weak are victimized, and the rich are victimized. Both are victimized. And so that's just because we have our wants and they run away with us. And he says something interesting that I want to mention right now because it'll tell later. It's one of the reasons why the whole political system can be made to work, according to Madison. I'm going to read it because it's worth having the exact words. Sometimes, he says, people form themselves into factions. And faction he identifies in a paper he wrote a year later so eight months later called Federalist 10, very important one. 
he writes in there that by faction he means any group animated by a passion or an interest that's adverse to the rights of other people. And that happens, just like in our own souls, we sometimes do things that are harmful to us and others are around them. In the body politic, we form into groups that are animated by interest in common or by passions, and we hurt other people. And he says, when we do this, he says, we might be restrained, he says, by, quote, a prudent regard to our own good as it is involved in the general and permanent good of the community. Which he says is of decisive weight. Now understand what that means. That means he's saying that it's a decisive fact that our individual good is wrapped up and ultimately inseparable from the good of the community. And by the way, if you think about that for a minute, that means that Harmony might be possible if you get things straightened out. There's a, there's a hope in that, right? It's, it's like uh, a lot of, in the founding, the whole idea of limited government depends very powerfully on self-interest, and we're going to see several ways why, why it happens. And uh, about the same time as the American Revolution, Adam Smith is publishing The Wealth of Nations, and there's that famous statement in there. He says, uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because in other words, the butcher's not doing us any favors. He brings the meat and he cuts it up for us and he gives it to us and we give him money. He does it for himself in a way. But think about that a little deeper, you see, because that means something else. That means that it is, in fact, in the interest of the butcher to do something for our good. And that means that harmony in the society is possible. But, Madison says, it is in fact true that our good is wrapped up in the general and permanent good of the community. And this is decisive, but we forget it. And we forget it in the midst of the moment and in the midst of something we want. We forget it, we can't remember. He also says, we're given to forgetting that honesty is the best policy. And again, I go back to it. Even if we forget that honesty in the, is the best policy, even if we forget that our own good is wrapped up in the good of the community, it's important that honesty is in fact the best policy. And it's important that our good is in fact wrapped up in the good of the community. And so, if you could get things organized the right way, using, among other things, not only this, but among other things, self-interest, you could potentially have a system of government that would, for the first time in history, guarantee the freedom of everybody. That's what they're trying to do. And so the question is, how do you go about that? And Madison says, a very important thing, he says, we're not going to do it in the old way. In the old way, here's what you would do. Uh, Aristotle writes that the city is made up of the one and the few and the many. And the one is a monarch, maybe. And the few are the aristocrats, maybe. And the many are the dem democracy, the people. And, and the fundamental conflict in society, he says, is between the many poor and the few rich. And so the way you make a good government, according to classical political philosophy, the best single way, over time, is to mix up the powers. That is to say, have an aristocratic house that has some power and have a democratic house that has some power and have a king who has some power and you share it around and they cancel each other out. And you have to understand that the people who made the American Revolution had read these old books with great care. And one of the proofs of the fact that they believed in these principles up here is that they simply refused to place in the American Constitution any power to any privileged class by birth or other station. That's not what they do. Madison writes, it is essential to a Republican government that it be derived from the great body of the society, not from an inconsiderable proportion or a favored class. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles, 
exercising their oppressions by a delegation of their powers might aspire to the rank of Republican and call themselves that. In other words, we are not going to do what was done before. In fact, to some extent, by the way, done in the English monarchy, monarch, constitutional monarchy. We're not going to pick out some people and call them special and give them special power to offset the power of other people. We're not going to do that. It is going to be a Republican government. But if you think for a minute, that makes the problem worse. Because now, you're going to have a majority, and they're just like us, right? That is to say, me on a good day is not a bad fella. And me on a bad day is pretty likely to do something wrong. And so, how are you going to give all of the power to the people and keep them from abusing it? That's the question. And the complications in the Constitution, which, by the way, many modern scholars say, come from the fact that they didn't trust the people. They actually come from the fact that they did trust the people. And, they, and there's none of these elements right here that, that involves anybody being picked out by birth or any other attribute apart from being a citizen and having a special authority because of that. It is what Madison calls, these are Republican remedies for Republican diseases. And the first of them, and now when I get to these, I want to go back to a point and I want to make it, I'll make it again at the end because it's very important to understand. We love to think of the Constitution of the United States as a big, complicated document, and you can't learn anything about it without reading, you know, 10,000 pages of court cases, for example. And uh, if you've got the patience to read 10,000 pages of court cases, God bless you for the odd person that you are. You don't need to do that. Here's a, another point. The Constitution is, you know, what, 5,000 words long, 4,500 words long, I think. Um, I think without the amendments, it might be 3,000 words long. And they're kind of complicated, but on the other hand, they actually boil down to something. And it's important to know what that something is, especially, by the way, in a time, this is kind of unprecedented this time, when there really are two alternative forms of government underway right now, and a very large part of what's done in Washington, D.C. today is for sure, and by the way, there's a consensus, I don't think anybody really disagrees with this, is for sure unconstitutional by the terms of the original Constitution. I like to talk about the architectural method of understanding this. If you go walk around Washington, D.C. and see a beautiful building, it's pretty likely that what's going on in it was going on in it at the time of the founding. And if you go around and see an ugly building, and by the way, most of the modern buildings are kind of ugly, what goes on it, on it is pretty new, and it wasn't really imagined by the original Constitution. And the question is, can we really do anything about that? Wouldn't there be terrible disruptions to the society if we tried to do something about that? And the answer is, maybe there would be. There might well be. But here's a possibility. It's a possibility that apart from, you know, the entitlement programs and stuff like that, you're just not going to abolish those overnight. I don't even favor it myself. What if you just started working toward back, back toward these things? That might be a course of action. And I have some ideas about how one would go about that. But the first step is to understand what these things allow, what happens because of these things. And I said before that uh, you could see how this one and this one might reduce down to this one. Representation might be the father of all of them. And I'll explain that for a minute. James Madison in the 63rd Federalist says that our government is unique, he says, because it is the first one in which the sovereign people are excluded entirely from making the operations of the government. Now think about that for a minute. This word sovereign, it's used in a variety of ways, and there's a lot of confusion in current literature about it, but I'll tell you what I mean by the word when I use it, unless I say I, I mean something different. What I mean by sovereign is being the source of political authority. 
In the United States of America, the people are sovereign. We, the people, make the Constitution. We act under our equal and natural right, self-evident these things are, to consent to the government over us. And we are sovereign. Now, who was sovereign in England at the time of the American Revolution? The answer to that is the king in Parliament was sovereign. And that meant that the king working through the Parliament was the source of British law. And there was a constitution, and he wasn't to violate it, and it was unwritten, but it meant something. But you couldn't say that the ultimate tribunal, Abraham Lincoln liked to call the people as they are organized under the Constitution, the highest tribunal in the land. You couldn't say that that was the people in England. And if the king and the parliament were sovereign together, then they were the executive and the legislative branches. And if you think about that for a minute, that means that when the sovereign actually sits down to make a law or to execute a law, that being the highest authority in the land, the sovereign can do whatever it wants. And in our country, that never happens. Compare it to Athens. In uh, Athens, in classic Athens, in the, in the great period of Athens, uh, sort of Socrates came rather toward the end of it, um, and it wasn't that long. But Athens was a democratic government at that time. And I once heard a great lecture about this from my friend Victor Hansen, so I'll quote him. Uh, the way it worked in Athens was the free citizens, who were a minority of all the citizens, were uh, you know, a small minority, less than, less than a third. Uh, they all had the power to vote. And when they wanted to pass a law, they would gather in the amphitheater up high on the Parthenon, and they would have an assembly, and they would vote. Well, the place where they would all gather would really only hold about a third of the citizens. So in modern political parliament, it meant that the <laughs> electoral results were heavily turnout dependent. <laughs> but they were forever turbulent, right? Because once they got in the room there in the, in the theater to vote, they'd have a big argument and a big debate, and they could vote just about whatever they wanted to because they were the sovereign, and they were right there meeting at that moment. And they were forever doing crazy things like uh, sending off a expedition by sea to go conquer some colony. And then the next week, you know, a somewhat different group of them would get together and they'd hear a different speech and they'd change their mind and they'd send off another group to go stop the first group. And very often the second group on the way to stop the first group, and you know, we're talking about war here, they would try to overtake them and arrest them and bring them back for trial and possible execution. Is forever stuff like that going on, right? Very changeable, right? But also unlimited because the sovereign was meeting to run the government. And, and that word sovereignty, think about that for a minute, what it means. Because it means you have the prestige, you have the recognized, rightful charge, ability, authority, to make the law. And in our country, the majority gets that from these principles right here. That means they're awesome in their force. They can do whatever they want, except they never just get to sit down and do it. Because think what happens, you see. Aren't you frustrated by politics sometimes? I am. You know, I. I, I when I was younger, especially, I'd be given to think, you know, if I could just have a week <laughs> to fix this, you know, stupid what they're doing. <laughs> you know, and you custom and carry on. But in our country, you don't get to do it. And think what gets checked and qualified by that. Because first of all, all of the people who are in the government know that the ultimate authority is out there watching them. And the ultimate authority is the subject of their laws. And they can chuck them out if they want to. Isn't that good? That means they got a fear, right? Where's the king when he met? You know, what he kept saying back to the colonies is, I'm the king, as was my father before me and as will be my son after me. 
And it doesn't make any difference what you think about that. Nobody gets to say that under these principles. And so the government is checked. It's the first check. Consent, except now put in representation. They work for us. But the second thing that is checked is us. Because we can't do anything right now, today. Isn't that interesting? That means that, you know, uh, almost every American, if you just look at the polls, almost every American would like to make very large changes to the government. It's not true that they all want to change it in the same direction. But, but nobody's particularly happy right now. And, you know, it's, it's kind of unusual for people to be this unhappy and for this long. It's a sign that something's going to have to change, I think, in our country. But they can't really do anything right now. It takes years to do anything. And what's that about, see? What, 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 it, 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 just, it just means that we have to wait for elections to act. But think for a minute. Also, in between the elections, we're encouraged to talk. We get to talk. In fact, our freedom of speech is guaranteed. There are actually threats against that these days. In doctrine, there's actually somebody today called the regulatory czar. His name is Sunstein. He's a law school professor. Used to be. And he likes to say that the government should allocate the right to speak now in order for it to come out equal. But the original scheme was very different from that. The original scheme was you can talk all the time. You're able to act only certain times, which if you think about it, kind of boils down to the idea, think before you act. Talk it through. The sovereign is confined to the active forming of a public opinion all the time, and then once in a while, a vote that brings it to a crisis and makes a decision. But by the way, no one vote, but we'll talk about that in separation of powers, will by itself do the job. That's the first obvious advantage or change in the government, if you don't like it, by representative politics. It allows power to be outside the government, and it allows those who are in control, ultimate control, to sit by the sidelines most of the time and just form their views. The second thing that happens because of representation is that things can get bigger. You know, if you've got the political system of Athens and the people have to get together in the legislature and vote, it means they can't live very far away from each other. Also, by the way, it means they can't vote very often because they've got to be making a living. What are they going to do? All sit in the legislature all the time? So it becomes possible for the country to get bigger if it's a representative country. And you know, there was a debate at the time of the revolution about how big it should be and how big government should be. But, the, but the, the people who won the argument about the Constitution, the Federalist Party, and the proposers of it, they argued very well that the states themselves were already pretty big. And the whole country was going to be really big. Did you know they named the Congress, the Continental Congress, in 1785, I think, is when the, the phrase was first used. And do you know who was the first representative of the American government to go across the continent and see how big it was? It was Lewis and Clark. And they got back to Washington in 1806. So that's, what, what is that? That's 31 years later, a generation later. They were thinking of a big country, and you can have a big country. And if you have a big country, there'll be, Madison makes this point, a lot of interests. They'll multiply. There'll be more than one or two. There'll be more than a hundred. There'll be more than a thousand. And because of that, it'll be harder for any one of them to dominate. And you think they're just encouraging us by this mechanism of bigness and representation for us to have a whole bunch of factions and them all to cancel each other out. And that's partly true. But it's not the whole story. Because Madison also says, I've got to find it here, worth reading the whole thing because it's good. It's not that long. He says that when you're debating over a big expanse, like if uh, you and your four friends that you've had all your life get together 
and you've had a conflict with another three friends and they're not there, or even enemies, and they're not there, and you get to talking about them and it's just you, you know, probably you'll go pretty far and say some stuff that's more than what you mean. But if you have to announce it out in public to a whole bunch of people you don't know, you might be more careful. Madison writes in the Tenth Federalist in the very place where he's writing about how you can multiply the interest and it'll be hard for any one of them to dominate. He also says, where there is a consciousness of unjust or dishonorable purposes, communication is always checked by distrust in proportion to the number whose concurrence is necessary. In other words, if you've got to try to persuade a lot of people, you're going to be careful what you say. And that's going to make the public discourse better. So like so many things we're going to see in the next time we talk, like so many things, the, the, the plan of the Constitution is drawing on the various aspects of human nature. Self-interest, wish for honesty, understanding that we have a common connection with each other and we'll all do, well, each of us will do better if we all do better. They're trying to find a way to draw on all of those things to propagate for the first time in history, for a long time, a system of self-government. And as I'm saying, these three things are essential to its working in the Declaration of Independence, in the Virginia Constitution, in the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, and in the Constitution of the United States in 1787. And we're going to talk a little more next time about how these all depend upon that and about how they work individually. Thank you.